Deuteronomy chapter 15. I'm going to try not to make this a political message, (laughs) but but, um, it may come out that way, so I apologize. And I'm not trying to push my views on anyone. We all have to think for ourselves. I am more of a biblicist. I like what the Bible has to say. You know, one of the things that I'm glad that I know about myself is that I'm ignorant. I'm not very smart. Um, I don't have a PhD. Uh, I can't really think very well. Sometimes my words get confusing. And I kind of thank God for that because I have something in front of me that I can depend upon. It's the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And so if I have a flaw in my thinking, all I need to do is go to the Bible and start reading it. And that's truth right there. And if it's not truth, if one chapter or one verse is wrong, then I might as well just throw this thing out. So I don't believe that. I believe it's 100% accurate. Why? Because it's God's word. And it has passed through the test time and time again. And so I believe it. So if I can start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and to read on, I know that's truth. And I can say that as truth because it's God's word saying it to us. And so I'm just glad that I am not uh, a smart person and that I can just depend on the Word of God. So if anything, you're going to get the Word of God. And I love teaching the Word of God because what I have to say really doesn't amount to a hill of beans. But what God has to say is very important. So tonight in Deuteronomy 15, we're going to look at the work of grace. The work of grace. Grace is a theology that we should all know and understand we should all understand that we are saved by grace ephesians 2 8 through faith and it's not of ourselves least anyone should boast paul the apostle said that our salvation our justification is by grace alone and not of works at all that should be a fundamental truth that every one of us as believers hold on to and yet We may understand that, maybe, but yet we try to apply works to that from time to time when we feel that we're not saved because we do uh, something that is against God's word. We sin, we fall short, and we go, wow, am I really saved then? Well, now you're adding works to it. You're now saying that if I just kept that law, then I would feel like I'm saved. You see, we really don't understand it. We really don't. We need to understand that by grace and grace alone and nothing else, we're saved. That's what makes the gospel so powerful. It's not by my wretched, selfish works. It's by Jesus Christ's blood on the cross. That was sufficient and more than enough. The substitutional sacrifice. He took my place to hold my sins so that I'm not held accountable to it. Then there is the grace that we just need every day in living dealing with one another, dealing with the people in this world and so forth. We need grace for one another. And, and grace is just having favor. God has had favor on us. We should have favor on others. So we're going to see the work of grace here in this chapter. Uh, Pastor and Arthur uh, Henry Ironside told a story about a new uh, convert who gave his testimony during a church service. And with joy in his heart, the man related how he had been delivered Uh, from a life of sin. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, um, that your sins were so bad you couldn't see how God could save you, that you were so wretched that you knew that if he were to judge you, that he'd have every right and be justified to send you to hell. I don't know if you've understood that or have felt that or have seen that in your own life. I have. Because I know my sins, and I know if I were to stand before God on my own, that he would have every right to judge me. In fact, when he uh, wrote the Sermon on the Mount, and when I read it, it just blew me away. For the first time, hearing it from a preacher and reading along with them, and I thought, wow, (laughs) I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. Yeah, I'm sinful. Amen, Uh, that's me right there. And God, you have every right. And I thought, literally, That's it. I'm going to hell, so I might as well just enjoy this life before I die and go to hell. That's what I thought my destiny was. And then the message came that, no, Jesus Christ took your place. And if you receive him into your heart, he will wash away all your sins and make you white as snow. And I'm like, what? Never heard that before. 
I heard it before, but I never understood it until God opened my eyes to my sin. And then that became real, and I embraced it, and it changed my life. So this man was, was having one of those situations where he was sharing the gospel through his testimony of how wretched he was and that God delivered him. And he gave the Lord all the glory, making it clear that he had done nothing to earn his salvation. The person leading the service didn't fully appreciate the truth that salvation is by grace through faith alone. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad that there was someone standing there that did not understand the grace of God? And they didn't appreciate the fact that he was saying that it's by grace alone, apart from works. And so he responded, says, you seem to indicate that God did everything when he saved you. Didn't you do your part before God did his? You know, that's always the case, right? You know, uh, do your part and God will do the rest. You know, no, there's no part of at all on our part. The new Christian jumped to his feet, he said, and he says, oh, yes, I did. For 30 years, I ran away from God. As fast as sin could carry me, I ran. That's my part. That's what I did. And God took me out, af- and God took out after me and ran me down. That was his part. See, we're saved by grace and by grace alone. We can do nothing to earn it. Our redemption is a gift of God. Our part is to acknowledge our sinfulness and inability to save ourselves. You cannot work your way into heaven. You cannot give enough money to get to heaven. You cannot pray enough to get into heaven. The Bible is clear. Jesus said it himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no other way, no, not at all, to the Father. And so it is only through him. So we must place our trust in Jesus alone, believing that he died on the cross for our sins. God has provided salvation for you. That's his part completely. And all we do is receive it by faith. That's all we do. We receive it by faith. And by the way, the faith that we have, he's given it to us. (laughs) So it's all his work. Now, That might sound unfair to some of us. We might think, well, why is it that some don't receive him? Some don't believe him by faith. Did he not give them the faith? No, I don't believe that. I believe he gave every man a measure of faith to believe. But they have to make the choice to believe or not to believe. And I'll give you that example that Justin gives us every time he comes here, right? If I were to come to your house... Uh, And I tell you, I'm going to cook you a steak. I go out to your barbie, and I cook up a steak, put it on a plate, get a fork and a knife, put it in front of you, and I start to cut up the meat for you, put it in nice little chunky sizes, and then I stick it uh, with a fork, and I bring it right up to your mouth, and then that's not enough. I take it right to your mouth. Now open up. Now I've done everything that I need to do. All you need to do is what? Just chew it. Take it and chew it. That's our part. That is our part. And yet God has given us that faith to either do it or not do it. So uh, we need Jesus, don't we? And Jesus only, that's all we need. The importance of the gospel is not what Jesus is giving us down here. The importance of the gospel is that Jesus is saving you from the pit of hell. We don't look at it that way. Not a lot of people do. They think that the gospel is to give us a peaceful, joyful life here on this earth. The gospel is to save us from the pit of hell. Jesus came to save that which was lost from the grips of Satan who has kidnapped us all and holding us as a ransom. So that is the sole purpose. Now, if we have a peaceful life, you know, wonderful, that's great, but doesn't guarantee that God's going to give us a peaceful life. There does come peaceful living when we apply biblical principles, though. That's for sure. But Jesus came to save us from the pit of hell. Don't ever lose that sight. Don't ever lose that sight because then you will begin to put your eyes on man and on the world and the culture, on the failure of man, and you may be in a position where you will have a choice to either follow Jesus or not. Keep your eyes on the sight that Jesus came to save you from hell. Just keep your eyes there and always remember, I've got to walk with him because he's saving me 
from utter destruction. So we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 15. This was written by Moses about 1,400 years before Christ. This chapter deals with the year of release or the sabbatical year. You may have heard it uh, phrased that way and should be compared with Leviticus 25. So if you want to check out uh, Leviticus 25 later, you can do that. And it will tell you about the days of release or sabbatical year. The first point, verses 1 through 6, we have a release of debts every seventh year. So let's go ahead and read. At the end of every seven years, now remember, remember this scene there before the promised land. Moses is giving them instructions before they get into the promised land. Uh, their ancestors already failed them. They were there at the promised land before. They wouldn't go in, even though God gave it to them and promised that they would be victorious. They were too scared. And so he let them wander for a while until they were all gone and a new generation is up. And he's instructing them now what they need to do to live in the promised land. So that's the context here. So now when you're in the promised land at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of death. And this is the form of the release. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not require it of his neighbor or his brother because it is called the Lord's release. Isn't that a wonderful commandment? Wouldn't that be great that every seven years your debts are forgiven. That would be wonderful. Buy a house, seventh year. I don't know you anything. It's my house. That's the way it works. Buy a car, finance it for 10 years. The end of seven years, sorry, I don't know you anything else. You know, that would be wonderful. And it would also keep us all on the same plane, wouldn't it? Everybody would be debt free and have enough resources to live another seven years. It's a great idea I, as I was thinking about it. <clears throat> so this, was, this is God's plan. He says, but of a, verse 3, but of a stranger or a foreigner, you may require it. So a non-Jewish person, you may require it. They weren't under this covenant. But you shall give it up. You shall give up your claim to what is owed by your brother, except when there may be no poor among you, for the Lord will greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance. Now, who is going to bless them? The Lord is going to bless them. Uh, not their ingenuity, not the fact that they are able to make money. No, it's the Lord that will bless them, even though they'll, because now think of the, the, the creditor or the lender, right? They have to actually, oh, I lent you $10,000 at seven years. You still owe me three. Okay, so I've got to just forgive that. So that would be a little hard to do if you were on that side of the fence. But they have to remember it's God who blesses them. And if they do this, God promise, I will take care of you. You'll be blessed. I'll give you what you need. Only if you carefully obey the voice of the Lord, verse 5, your God, to observe which with care, all these commandments which I command you today. For the Lord your God will bless you just as he promised you. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow from nations. You shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. Now the Israelites are told by Moses that they must cancel all debts to other Israelites after seven years of service. Money was always loaned with the understanding that every seventh year, Debts would be canceled. Everyone knew that. It was God's law in Leviticus 25, as I said. If their father, their mother, their brother, their sister, their uncle, their aunt, their cousin, or someone from another tribe owed them something, they were to forgive them after seven years. So there was no long-term debt in this sense. Money could never be borrowed or owed for more than six years. That was the length of the loan. He gave them specific instructions on how to do this with their fellow Israelites. This included the return of property that had been given as collateral for debt. You can see that in Leviticus 25. Oftentimes when, let, let's just say you had a bad year, your crops didn't grow, uh, you have no money, you can't provide for your family, so what do you do? You sell your land to someone else. Uh, they were able to take that land because they have the resources, they're prosperous, they have you know, whatever it needs, equipment, and they get your land prosperous, but at the end of the seven years, they have to give it back to you. That's the law. So this was the Lord's release, as verse 2 says. This was an important matter to God. This is something that God made into a law. 
And as Israel obeyed this commandment, there would never be a permanent underclass in Israel. Everyone would be on the same plane. Some might go through a bad period, but would have the opportunity to rebuild their lives financially on a regular basis. What about the non-Jew? Well, he, he talked about the non-Jew. He told them that they were uh, allowed to require payments from the non-Jews. This is only for Jews only. After seven years, sorry, you still have to make your payments. He also said that the people are allowed to lend to other nations, but they were not to borrow from other nations. This would then put them in bondage to those other nations like Egypt. And he didn't want them to go into bondage to them and serve them. So he told them, do not borrow from them, but you can give to them if you'd like and then hold them accountable. And he told them that they will rule over these nations, but no nation would rule over them. That was God's heart because he wanted to rule over them. He was their God. He was their God. And see, for us as, as an application here, we need to allow God to rule over us. Well, how does God rule over us? Well, we read his Bible and we follow what it has to say but we need to read it. Now, we're all flawed and skewed. We all have our, our issues and we have our cultural struggles that we uh, deal with ourselves because we believe the lies or we've been raised a certain way and so forth. You need to get rid of all those. Well, how do I get rid of them? By reading the Word of God. Let me give you an example of this real quickly. Uh, um, I was talking with someone and sharing with, with uh, Nicole and Xavier this. I was talking with someone and they were telling me how the culture has gotten into their children but at the same time he had just finished praying how we need to learn to love ourselves more and when he said that i'm like wow that's not biblical because the bible says we love ourselves too much already we're to love our god and we're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves is what the bible says as we love ourselves as we love ourselves, it's saying that you already love yourself. And then Paul adds to that in Ephesians, says, no man ever hated his flesh. And so I'm just uh, you know, listening to it, and I'm thinking, wow, the culture has got into you, but you can't see it. And yet you see it in your children. You see, we're all flawed and skewed. And so how do we get rid of that? By reading the Bible. We've got to read it from Genesis to Revelation. Every book, every chapter, every verse and highlight it and underline it and put notes in it and study it. That's the only way to get the culture out of you. Reverse osmosis. You know, get the Word of God in you, and it pushes out the culture from you. And then you have principles and values that are biblical, that are biblical instead of being cultural. Well, I've just been taught that all my life. But is it true? Is it biblical? Do you even care? We should care, but we need to read the Bible. So if Israel were to obey the Lord, God said, I will bless you, I will prosper you, nations will come bow before you in just being obedient to what I command you. And there's a principle there, right? Follow God's word and he says you'll have a good life. It's not why he came, but it works. We'll have a good life. Now let's look at the second point, 7 through 11, the command to be generous to the poor. This was another requirement of god take care of the poor help them out unfortunately there are christians that don't like the poor and don't want to help them out we have a great ministry here that helps out the, the homeless and also those right now with the uh, the pandemic uh, they they don't have a job or they're in between jobs or they're not making ends meet so we provide food every sunday and we've been doing this for years now we're helping the poor and we have lost people from this church because we're helping the poor. I literally had someone say, why would you help those people? And first of all, I'm like, whoa, whoa, those people? Like if they're someone less than you? And this is a Christian person. God, they said Jesus wouldn't do that. I'm like, wait, what Bible are you reading? And like, oh, now I'm really like, wow, I thought I knew this person. But because they just felt superior to some other person, they felt that they were less than them, and that they're, you know, they're just leeches, and that's all they'll ever be. Now, that's not up for me to decide. That's up to God, not for me. We don't look at them that way. We look at an opportunity to share the love of Jesus to them. 
because at one time I was a leech. <laughs> I was leeching on my friends. I was leeching on you know, my dad. Talk about, you want to know a leech and a cockroach at the same time? I'd literally go in the morning in my dad's room while he's sleeping and I'd pull his pants that he had laid there and I'd pull out a couple of dollars, sometimes five dollars. Sometimes if he had a lot, I'd pull a twenty dollar bill out and I'd have money for the day. That's a leech <laughs> taking for myself. And then years later, I found out my, I told my mom, I told that story here at the church and my mom came up to me afterwards. She wanted to hit me. She said, your dad blamed me all those years thinking I took the money. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Tell you, I'm, I was a sinner. I am wretched. And I agree with God. I need Jesus. But yet, why are Christians that way? No compassion, no love. Remove those things. No heart like Jesus. Because Jesus came for the poor. He says the well have physician, well, the well have everything they need, but it's the poor that needs help. So I've come for the poor. And that's what God is showing here to the Israelites, how much he loves the poor. Look at what it says in verse 7 through 11. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his needs, whatever he needs. And not necessarily just give it for free all the time, but there might be times when you need to lend it to him. And then seven years forgive him, because that's the, that's the deal. He says, beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart. Isn't that interesting? It's wicked to think that you wouldn't help the poor. That's not my words, that's God's word here. saying, the seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry out to the Lord against you, and it becomes sin among you. You see what's going on? In other words, someone comes up, hey, brother, you know, can you uh, help me out? And he goes, oh, I, I don't know. It's like it's getting close to the seventh year. If I help you out, then I'm out of luck. I'm going to lose everything I gave you. I don't know if I want to do that. that. That's what he's talking about. So what's he putting his trust in? His money. Right? Not in God. And God's saying, look, even if it's three days before the seventh year, lend it. I, you know you're going to lose it, but don't worry. I got your back. I will make sure you have plenty of it. We don't think that way, nor do we believe God that way. How, do you, how come you can say that, Pastor? Because people don't tithe anymore. I see it. They don't tithe. They don't give anymore to the church like they used to back in the 70s. They were like tithers. But I think that was more because of the faith movement. Tithe, and God will give you 100% back. And so they were like a lottery. You know, let me just give my tithe, and hopefully God will really bless me with a hundredfold on that. And then they realize that's not what God told you to tithe. <laughs> that's so unbiblical. But the love of money is the root of all evil. And so this type of person that acts that way, oh, I don't know, got a year to go, I might lose it all, I'm not going to lend it. And that's, that's the evil and wicked heart. Don't do that, I'll bless you. Verse 10, you shall surely give to him and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and in all to which you put your hands. Who will bless you? The Lord will bless you. He's the one that gives you. He takes care of you. He promises that, especially if you give. That's a principle that I really believe works because I, I do it all the time. I used to work for Southern California Edison, and the last few years of my working there was making over $110,000 a year. I remember getting my first biweekly check, and there was a, an amount of $10,000 on it. And I'm like, wow, this could be really great. And then the Lord calls me to go full-time in ministry. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is a lot of money. But I trusted the Lord. We trusted the Lord. And do you know we have done more in full-time ministry than we have working for Edison? I have been to Israel, I've been to South Sudan, I've been to India, I've been to uh, Uganda. I've been to more places in my life doing ministry than if I was working, making all that money, and I still couldn't afford to go anywhere. 
And God has paid our bills, taken care of us as he promised. So I believe tithe works. I believe being a giving person works. The more you give, the more he blesses you. I was thinking about this just today. Uh, and you guys, some of you that work here know this or work around here and stuff. Uh, we used to charge for sodas. We used to charge for sodas and water. So you'd pay a dollar for a water, right? Soda is two dollars, right? You come here if you want a soda, you go to the refrigerator and just, you know, we trusted everyone to make sure they paid. <clears throat> and this year, because of the whole pandemic and the whole thing, I just started, you know what, forget that. Just put the water out, whatever, just they can take as much as they, they need. Then uh, on Wednesday nights, I uh, started buying pizza for everyone. And I was thinking, it's interesting how in the past, I didn't do that. And we made it. God was, God was blessing us. But this year, we decide, just give it. We trust the Lord. But God has blessed us even more. He has blessed us even more. And I just thought, wow, Lord, that principle really works. So we give out the water. We bring pizza on Wednesday night for everyone to eat, you know, free of charge. <clears throat> There's a principle there that God sees the heart and that that heart is a giving heart instead of a taking heart. And he blesses that heart and it works. It says, for the poor you will never cease from the land. The poor will never cease from the land, verse 11. Therefore, I command you, it's not a suggestion, guys, it's a command, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in the land. Let me say this, though. Be careful, because <clears throat> there are some people out there that get this, and they're going to prey on you because they're takers. Uh, <clears throat> they, they'll come up to you, and they'll Oh, poor, poor me, I can't do this, and I can't pay this. And you got to be very careful because they're doing it to you, but they're also doing it to someone else. That happened here in this church. And I'm hearing of people saying, well, I paid like three, three times of this, this, of this for that person. And I'm like, really? And another person, ah, I paid three. Okay, that, that, be careful. Be very wise. And who you're you're giving it to, because there are scammers out there too. At the same time, these are legit poor people that um, have a need. Those are the ones that we need to help with, not the ones that are scamming us. Look at the third point: the command to release slaves every seventh year, twelve through fifteen. So this is all speaking about grace, isn't it? Right? Uh, you're to forgive seven years, have grace, and just forgive it. You help the poor, have grace, help them out. Here, if you have a slave, you are at the seventh year to release them too and have grace. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serve you six years, verse 12, then in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. Now understand uh, the concept of slavery in this culture. It's not what we have seen in our time with, with the Africans being brought here, with the... Uh, Asian being brought here with, with Hispanics and with the Irish and Italian who have been uh, abused and sold into slavery in certain places and times. It wasn't just the Africans, by the way. There were a lot of different ethnic groups that were enslaved. Um, that's not the kind of slavery that they're talking about. This is a type of slavery where <clears throat> you couldn't provide for your family. And so you would then go sell yourself to someone and say i will come and work for you and you will take care of my family that will be the agreement so you become their slave they now own you and you now work for them and you have to work for them for seven years uh, as the agreement so that's the the, the type of slavery that was back then uh, not forcing someone into slavery verse 13 and when you send him away Free from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. You shall supply him literally uh, from your flock, from your threshing floor, and from your wine press. From what the Lord your God has blessed you with, you shall give to him. See, it's a little different slavery here. Seven years, you let him go, and you provide for them. Give them some threshing floors, some flocks, a wine press. Help them to get off their feet and move forward from that point on. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing today. So the slaves here are those who had to sell themselves into slavery to, 
take care of their debts. Moses told the Israelites that they had to free all Hebrew and female slaves after they served seven years. The Hebrews had to work this full six-year term in order to regain uh, his mortgage on the land or the land owner's status, whatever, whatever it was that they were indebted to. So they did, would not go away empty-handed. And so they were to give to them so that they can start their life over again. This was God's way of helping them out as slaves. That is grace. And then we come to the fourth point, the law of the bond servant or bond slave, 16 through 18. And if it happens that he says to you, I will not go away from you, that is the bond servant, if they decide, you know what, I kind of like it here, I don't want to leave. Because he loves you and your house since he prospers with you. Then you shall take an awe and thrust it through his ear to the door. And he shall be your servant forever. Also to your female servant you shall do likewise. It shall not seem hard to you when you send them away free from you. For he has been worth a double hire servant in serving you six years, when the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. Again, the same principle is there. We see this also in Exodus uh, 21, 5 through 6. So if a slave loved his master and he wanted to continue to serve him, this was called a bond slave. In fact, you see it in Jude, right? Uh, Jude calls himself a bond slave of Jesus Christ. So that means I'm freely choosing to serve you. I'm a bond slave to Jesus Christ. There are people that are not bond slaves to Jesus Christ. They're forced to serve, maybe by their husband or their wife or their parents and so forth, and they feel like they're, they're forced to be in church. They're forced to do certain things. That's not a bond servant. That's someone that uh, doesn't understand uh, what Jesus has done for them and they're not appreciative enough to realize that they owe Jesus their lives. They're confused in understanding what God has really done for them. So they're really not at a point where they um, have really changed from the inside. They haven't surrendered completely. I'm not saying they're not Christians. I'm just saying that they haven't totally surrendered to the Lord yet. A bond slave is one that says, I love it here. I love serving here. I love being here. I love everything about it. I enjoy it. It's a passion that I have, and I just want to stay here. That's how I feel about ministry. I can spend hours and hours here at church more than I can at home. <laughs> I don't mind it. I've got a nice little office. I have a little nursery next to my office that I can lay on the couch and just study and read. Sometimes I fall asleep, wake up, read again and study. And I do that from 4.30 in the morning until sometimes 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. And I'm here all day. And I love it. It's just such a beautiful place to be. And it's done because God has saved me from so much in my life and i'm appreciative to that and he's called me to it so if you feel like i love doing it and i freely will serve you for the rest of my life you are a bond servant of jesus christ so the willing slave could stay and his status would be declared by piercing through his ear lobe with an awe so it wasn't that they pierce them to the <laughs> side of the door and let them hang there no they would pierce it and get ear pierced and he put a ring through there and it signified that he belonged to someone of his own free choice jesus is a great fulfillment of this right because he was a willing slave he said i did not come to be served but to serve and to save those that are lost he became a ransom for many, right? That was his heart. That was his passion. The scene that always gets me <clears throat> in the passion of Jesus Christ is that scene where, where Mary comes to pick up his son when he fell holding the cross. And he looks over with all the blood and thorns in his head and he's like in pain. And he looks over at her and says, look, mom. That always chokes me up when I say it. <laughs> Look, Mom, I'm making everything new. And I'm like, oh. He wasn't there even because of the pain. It was like he was focused on what he was going to do on that cross for all of us. He said, Mom, I'm making all things new so that you could be saved, so they could be saved, so that person could be saved, so they can come to know God, so they can get to heaven. That's why I'm doing all of this. That was in his heart. He was a willing slave. 
In Psalms 40, it says, My ears you have opened. It speaks of, his, of this opening of the ear in the bond slave ceremony, that his ears were pierced. <clears throat> he was willing, a willing bond slave of the Father, very clearly. In fact, Isaiah 50, 5-7 shows that Jesus' character as the willing slave was most perfectly shown in his suffering on the cross. Uh, the Lord God had opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away, uh, 5 through 7. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. I set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. That's the heart of Jesus. He gave it all for us so that we could have eternal life. The word slave there, um, or servant, is doulos in the Greek. <clears throat> and it does describe slave. This came out several years ago when John MacArthur did a really in-depth study on the word doulos. And the conclusion of it was it meant slave. And there was a lot of, ah, we don't like using the word slave because of the you know, connection to slavery and blah, 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 and all that stuff. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> that's what the Bible says. Slave. We are slaves to Jesus Christ. Now, he is not a bad master. He is a great master. And he is a master that you want to serve with all of your heart. Now, let's look at the fifth point, the principle of the firstborn. Verse 19, <clears throat> all the firstborn, as he continues, all the firstborn males that come from your herd and your flock, you shall sanctify to the Lord your God. You shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. So as they go into the promised land, one of the things that God wanted to remind them of is that the firstborn is important. They're mine. And so everything that is firstborn, whether it's your children, whether it's your flock, whatever is, Israel is my firstborn. God would say. They're special to him, and so they were to be set apart for God, whether for his work in the tabernacle as, as priests or whatever, or whether the flock to be offered up as sacrifices, they were the Lord's. And he desired them to remember that. Why? Because he wanted them to remember that they were his firstborn and they're a special treasure in his eyes. In fact, the Bible says they're an apple. They're the apple of his eye. He loves Israel. Now the last point, and we'll close up here. Uh, what to do with giving of the firstborn. <clears throat> so, verse 20 through 23. You and your household shall eat it before the Lord your God year by year in the place which the Lord chooses. But if there is a defect in it, if it is lame or blind or has any serious defect, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. You may eat it within your gates. The unclean and the clean person alike may eat it as if it were a gazelle or a deer. So these were set apart for the Lord uh, as a sacrifice, the animal firstborn. And he said, only you shall not eat its blood. You shall pour it out on the ground like water because it represents the blood of Jesus Christ. The life comes in the blood. So the firstborns were to be eaten in God's presence at the location that God had selected there. And usually that would have been the... Um, tabernacle or the temple that came along later on um, they were to be given to the priests for sacrifice unto the lord and the portion of that sacrifice then went to the family that brought the animal it was given so that they could eat and enjoy it ceremonially eating before the lord uh, there's a picture we see in genesis where they're sitting under a terebinth tree they have a basket and they're eating and so forth and i always see that as a picture uh, of having a picnic with the in the presence of the lord the Lord loves it when you eat with him. You, you see that throughout some of the Gospels. Jesus was always eating and feeding and sitting with the disciples in the upper room, eating and drinking. He loved that because that's where you really get intimate. You notice how when you invite people over, where's the place that you all hang out the most? The kitchen, because everybody can snack and eat and talk and you know, feel comfortable there. There's just something about that, and the Lord knows that. And so he loves it when you sit and you eat with him. So any animals, though, that had defects such as blind, lame, were not allowed to be sacrificed because it spoke of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was a blameless sacrifice. He had no sin in him at all, no blemish. 
And so he wanted to really make that clear to the Israelites that the Messiah will be perfect in every way or form. And so anything that's offered up to the Lord has to be perfect. Now, if this was the case, then the animal was given to the priests, uh, but not sacrifice unto the Lord. Oftentimes they would take the animal that had a blemish and they would then turn it in for money, sell it, take the money, and then offer that up uh, to the Lord <coughs> as a sanctification. And then Moses here ends with, um, don't eat the blood that's in the animal because it speaks of Jesus again. There's life in the blood of Jesus, isn't there? Amen. So where's the grace? The grace is seen all over this here. <clears throat> grace is favor. We don't deserve grace. You don't deserve to be forgiven. You're in debt, but we're going to forgive you. You don't deserve grace because you forgive someone, but yet God is going to bless you because he's a gracious God. I went to the dentist today, and I'm talking a little bit funny. At least I feel like I'm talking a little bit funny. I got a crown here that they broke off, and um, <clears throat> they cut crowns in half, and they should just fall off. Well, this one, half of the crown fell off. The other half stuck on to the tooth. So then they cut that in half, and they had a little pair of pliers, and I feel it, and, and it pops off. There's still a quarter on there. So now they have a problem getting that quarter off, so they're grinding, 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 giving me more stuff because I'm feeling it now. And um, they got this tool, this little piece with little hooks, and they try to grab it, and it has a weight on it, and it's, uh, the end has a piece uh, weld on, and it bangs against it. So they go, bang, bang, and they're trying to bang it off. And I'm laying there, okay, okay, God. The Bible says that you're a good God, that you love us, Lord, and that you want nothing but good for us. There's no evil in your heart. So I know, Lord, that you're going to get me through this, you know. And there was one point where he hit a spot, you know, and he's like giving me shots all over. And I'm like, just go for it. And I'm like, ah, as he's grinding away. I'm like, oh. And he finally, and all of a sudden, there it goes. There's just a little sliver left, you know, a little sliver. And he gets that tool again. Bang! And finally it just pops off. And I'm like, Thank you, Lord. I knew you were good. <laughs> I knew you were good. God is, God is good. He is good in every situation that we have to endure because that's who he is. He is good. I wish he would have done it a little faster, but he's still good. He's a good God, and he loves us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word, Lord. Lord, though these ceremonies and these commandments don't have anything to do with us today, Lord. But, Lord, they do show us a very clear picture of your grace, Lord. And we thank you for the grace, Lord, that you have shown us, Lord, in this life and in our salvation, Lord. May you continue to pour grace on us, Father. We don't deserve it, but we're praying for more grace in our life, that you would bless us so that we can give you the glory, so that we can tell others how good you are, Lord, because you're a good God. Bless us today, Lord. Bless us as we go home. Redeem this time. Give us a good night's rest, Lord God, ready to hit the next day, Lord. Give us good news, Father, in the election, Lord, uh, as we just continue to put our faith and trust in you, Lord Jesus. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>